All right, excellent. Um, I noticed I uh, need to probably update my slide templates to uh, a more modern resolution. <laughs> but um, uh, all right, I'll be talking about Lizard FS. I'll try to get this done in less than three or four hours. Um, actually, this is a pretty basic overview. I will do a, a live demo of how it sort of works. Um, and and we can kind of play with it a little bit. Um, I tried to kind of hit a little of everything in my slides, um, but if if you have like a more specific question, just feel free to ask. Um, you know, I'll try to hit some of the things that you might not think to ask that you should be aware of. Um, but if you want to know, hey, can it do this or can it do that or whatever, I, I can probably tell you. All right, so uh, who am I? Um, so uh, my name is Rich Freeman. I know I'm kind of a, a new to this particular group, at least for some. Um, so I kind of have a weird mixed background. So uh, I studied biochemistry a long time ago. Um, I actually work in pharmaceuticals as a business analyst, um, but I uh, am a Gen 2 developer and open source enthusiast. Uh, uh, and I basically don't do any of that at work. It's uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, so my first exposure to Linux was um, a book I got in a, I guess it was in a computer store or something like that, like back when that was a thing um, that contained a Slackware CD. Um, it was around 1994. Um, it used a file system called UMS-DOS actually for the root file system. Um, and UMS-DOS was this way to run a POSIX file system on top of, I'm about to say FAT32, but it was not FAT32. It was like the old 8.3 days, uh, you know, whatever FAT16 or FAT whatever it was way back then. Um, and you just mounted slash user off the uh, CD-ROM and because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, trying to actually install the distro on my hard drive would have uh, basically required just taking the entire hard drive. Uh, in any case, I got into Linux more seriously in the 90s. Um, I started out on Mandrake and then moved to Gen 2, and I've pretty much been using Gen 2 the entire time since then. Um, and I've been using LizardFS, which we're going to talk about, for about three and a half years. I uh, will try to send out these slides afterwards, although I haven't managed to get onto the mailing list. Somebody needs to approve my subscription, so I'll, I'll get that link to somebody to share. Um, all right, so I'm going to try to give you guys a little bit of background, um, just in general, features, pros, cons, what is a distributed file system, um, that sort of a thing. Um, I'll try to give sort of a superficial overview of how LizardFS works, uh, talk, uh, oh, I mentioned pros and cons, but I'll get to the pros and cons. Uh, and then I'll actually do a demo and actually show you how to actually run. And what, this, this is actually one of the beauties of LizardFS. It's actually really simple to get going. We're actually going to start this from basically just a generic. I, I've got a couple of uh, containers running Ubuntu that literally have nothing on them but Ubuntu. Um, I don't think I did anything other than just set host names up and that sort of thing. Um, all right, so some term, terminology. Um, to, if you're not familiar with distributed file systems. So most of you are probably aware of things like RAID, ZFS, ButterFS, and so on, where you basically have one host and you can take many disks and assemble them into a single file system, often with redundancy, although you don't necessarily have to have redundancy. Um, and that all, is all in a single host. Now, sort of the next technology that really became somewhat big, it, it, I don't, this hasn't really gone as, as far, um, it's not as necessarily favored, is um, a cluster file system. So this is where you can have many hosts that are sharing a common set of disks, but they're actually shared at the block device level. So via whether it's iSCSI or you know, some sort of bus that can allow it, you have multiple independent hosts that all can simultaneously talk to the hard drive. And so basically all the locking and the, the and that sort of thing is all done on the drive itself um, since the hosts don't have shared memory or anything like that. Um, and then sort of the next, and, and distributed file systems, this is what's like Ceph is or, 
Blizzard FS, or I think Gluster might be a distributor. I, I actually don't remember offhand if that is. Um, but this is sort of the more the way you would probably think to design it today, um, sort of like a, a, a tiered approach. And this is where, you know, you have multiple servers. So you actually run, so disks are within a server, but then a, like a daemon or something running on that server is what accesses the disks. And then those daemons talk over the network to each other to sort of create the networked distributed file system. So hosts only are responsible for their own hardware internally. And that that's kind of how you would probably design it today if you were thinking to design something like this. So let's talk about a couple of popular ones. So I mentioned GlusterFS. That's a legacy one. It's still, I think it's still like the official Red Hat um, solution, um, but it's definitely legacy at this point. I I don't know a ton about it, but I have heard it's kind of messy to use. Um, I would not, unless you like need paid Red Hat support or something for it, I, I wouldn't start something new with that today. I can um, comment on it after we're done recording because it's entertaining, but yes, Cluster being legacy is a very nice way to put it. Yeah. Um, so Ceph uh, is definitely worth mentioning. That Ceph is pretty much the standard these days. Um, it's its biggest hallmark is it's extremely scalable. Um, I, I just say, if in doubt, use Ceph. Um, it, it is sort of the default, you know. Now, there's some cons to it as well, and I will talk about that, which is why I am using Lizard FS. Um, but I would never make like I would only choose Lizard FS if you understand Ceph as well and have, understand why you're choosing to not use it, um, because Ceph really is, you know, that's like the nobody got fired for picking Ceph, um, assuming you know what you're doing and don't have the whole thing melt down on you. You should might get fired for that. Um, <clears throat> All right, so um, MooseFS and LizardFS are, are very simple distributed file systems um, that have a single master server. So MooseFS came first and LizardFS is a fork. They both sort of had that like that MySQL like um, sort of like open core kind of model to them. Um, and that's kind of why LizardFS became a thing because some key parts of MooseFS were not open source and LizardFS offered more open source stuff. But of course, since then, MooseFS has actually opened more stuff up. So there's pros and cons to each. And actually, I, I don't think I've touched on that. That's, that's something else I would look at today if I was starting out. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, you have clients. So by client, this is something that's going to mount a file system. Um, so you run a Fuse um, driver on the client. Um, they do have clients for Windows. I think they might even have it for Mac OS. This came off their website, so I hope they have a client for Mac OS. Uh, these are proprietary. <laughs> um, so you have to pay the license to get those. But the the Linux one is open source. Um, as a single file system can be mounted by many of these at once. So it's a little like NFS or something like that or Samba in that sense. Um, so the networking part of it is kind of built in, which is a big advantage of these um, distributed file systems. Um, and then basically these talk to a master server. This hosts all the metadata. Um, and and all the indexing and knows where everything is stored. So this this is definitely a performance bottleneck compared to something like Ceph, um, but it also makes it a lot simpler because it it works kind of like how you would probably think something like this should work. Um, you can optionally have shadow masters, which are sort of uh, replicas for uh, failover. Um, and then you have what are called chunk servers, and this is where the actual storage happens. Of course, these are all daemons, so you could run the master server and the chunk server on the same host or different containers or whatever. Um, and so the chunk servers, you know, look at the hard drives and actually store data on them. And so when a client wants to find something, it'll ask the master server, hey, um, 
you know, well, if it wants just a directory list, the master server would just handle that because that's just metadata. But if it wants to open a file, it's going to ask this master server, hey, I want to open this file and read this block out of it or whatever. And the master server will say, okay, well, that's over on this chunk server over here. And then the client will reach over to that chunk server and say, hey, send me that file. Um, I think I may have already told you most of this. I'm going to uh, skip some of this. Um, CGI servers, I didn't mention. So these are basically like web status pages. And I'll, I'll actually show you what that looks like in our, our test setup. So it kind of has like a web interface. So you, can, you can't do much of it except view. Um, but it's still, it's, it is actually really useful um, to see what's going on. Uh, Shadow masters are replicas. Um, and they actually run, they're basically, they are a master server that are just live replicating and it's not set up. You can only have one master at a time, um, but um, these are like live replicas and they're pretty easy to promote into masters. And in fact, there is a non-open source component that will do like the Ceph monitoring where it'll figure out if your master goes down and will automatically promote a shadow master to be your new master um, for high availability. And then there's also a meta logger, which is, it seems a little redundant with the shadow master. It also replicates the data, um, except that it, what it, this does is it just regularly contacts the master server and stores log files um, basically off of it. Now from this, if you copy those log files back to a master server, you can reset, you know, recapture the data state. However, the meta logger doesn't actually run the master server. And this actually, I mean, if so, if you're like in a RAM constrained environment, if you have a lot of small files or something, so you have a lot of metadata, the master server can use a lot of RAM. And so shadow masters will use just as much memory because they're basically live failover master servers. The meta logger um, doesn't, it's just spooling log files to disk. So this should not require much RAM. So I think that's why they have the distinction. Um, some key features of LizardFS. So it is distributed. Um, uh, the, key, the key benefit of that is your full hardware redundancy for the chunk servers. So um, like in RAID, you can lose a hard drive. Um, in LizardFS or any other distributed file system, you could lose an entire host. So if I were to go uh, to one of my chunk servers and just yank the power cord out of it, the everything would just keep running as if nothing had happened. Um, so it's a lot more redundant than just something like RAID. Um, it has the high availability component, um, which will automatically fail over. I guess you could probably build something to script that. It's not, it's a couple of steps to, to manually fail over a shadow when I've done that in some recovery scenarios, but um, obviously, doing it manually is not going to be high availability. Um, it has a Windows client you can pay for. Um, like most distributed file systems, you can mount it by multiple hosts at once. So you can have 10 different Linux um, hosts all mounting off of this um, file system, and they can all read and write, and they all see each other's changes um, concurrently. And it does support snapshots, which are a copy on write. So if you want to you know, take a snapshot of a directory or the entire file system or whatever, you can do that um, very rapidly um, and uh, use those for backups or any of the things you would normally use a snapshot for. Uh, I will say that they create objects in the file system, so it causes your RAM use to go way up on the server. So like if, if you snapshot the whole file system, you basically double the amount of RAM being used by the master server. It's RAM use isn't that bad unless you have because I, I tend to use it for storing big things. Um, but if you had lots of small files, that would become an issue. Um, and, and in fact, the other thing is I'm not sure how storage efficient small files are. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of overhead if you're just storing like little tiny things. So, you know, this is probably more suitable for big stuff. Um, 
some other features, and this is definitely is a distinguishing from Ceph. The chunk servers, which are the servers that actually have the disks on them, have very minimal memory requirements. Um, and then the master memory is proportional to the file count, basically, because um, it's just metadata. So it's how many files are there is what the affects the master. Um, and uh, as I'll get to, uh, Ceph is not minimal memory. The, the devices that actually store the the hosts that actually store the files that contain the drives need uh, quite a bit of memory on Ceph or it can melt down. Um, so this was one of the key reasons I went with this is I went, I'm running this on Raspberry Pi 4s and um, Rock Pro 64s and, you know, ARM single board computers with like two or four gigs of RAM um, on the actual storage end. And I could never have done Ceph that way. Um, it has support for mirroring. Um, with arbitrary replicas, so you can have your, you know, typical two copies of everything mirror, but you can have three copies or four copies or five copies or however many. Um, it does support erasure coding. This is actually one of the features that MooseFS did not have open source, which is part of what led to BlizzardFS taking off. Um, so erasure coding is basically like RAID 5 or RAID 6 or something like that. Um, but it's it's done sort of at a block level. So um, you don't have to, you can have seven hosts and have a total of five stripes. And it just means that, you know, each section of data will be written across five of the seven hosts. And then another chunk of data will be written across a different set of five of the seven hosts until they're all balanced. And you can mix all these. You can have one file that's, you know, essentially RAID 1, like two copies, another file has got three copies, and this file is striped across five drives. And and it could be three data stripes and two parity stripes or you know, however you want to do it. Um, all of the, so goals are basically what, what we're referring to when we talk about like how many replicas of a file there are or how many stripes, those are called goals. So they're like storage policies and you can dynamically change these. So something could be essentially like a RAID six and you can change, you know, we're gonna turn that to a RAID one. And what it'll do is sort of, it'll create two RAID one replicas. And once they're both good, it'll delete all the RAID six ones. Um, and a big thing, I mean, I'm talking rattling around all these features, which makes it seem complicated, but it's actually really simple because of that master server um, compared to something like Ceph, this is really simple. Now, that comes with some downsides, like they didn't just put the complexity in Ceph for no reason. Um, but this is really nice for at home or something like that. I think somebody is not on mute. Um, all right, so let's talk about some pros and cons. Um, so some advantages of LizardFS. Um, so you get the, the host level redundancy, like something like Ceph, um, but it's a lot less complex, as I've mentioned. Uh, the memory requirements are far lighter than Ceph. So I'm running the storage components on, and I'm talking like multiple 10 terabyte hard drives on a, on a Pi or something with two gigs of RAM. And it, and the RAM isn't particularly utilized. Whereas um, Ceph, usually the, the, the guidelines I've seen tossed around, I think there originally was one gigabyte of RAM per terabyte of hard drive. So if you had two 12 terabyte hard drives, they would recommend having 24 gigs of RAM. Well, you're not gonna stick 24 gigs of RAM on a Pi or all, you know, actually, more than a few hard drives, you know, it's it's hard to even fit on a desktop motherboard that much RAM. So you're talking a lot of RAM for Ceph. Now, I think the newer versions, they've revised down those guidelines a little, but it might be like two gigabytes of RAM per hard drive or four gigabytes per hard drive or something like that. And so it's still a lot of RAM. And this is on the node that just does the storage, not like, well, Ceph doesn't have a master per se in the same way. Um, but uh, in any case, the memory requirements are very expensive. And these are the nodes that you tend to have a lot of. Um, 
Now, one advantage of both Ceph and Blizzard FS versus something like MD Admin is that you're not limited to the storage capacity of one host. So if you're going to use like RAID or ZFS or something like that, you're limited to how many hard drives you can cram into one physical box. Now, granted, you're, there are boxes you can buy that can fit a lot of drives, but that gets like on a desktop. I mean, I used to mess around with LSI host bus adapters and and those those four like the the um, mini SAS connectors and all that stuff, and it, it was always a pain in the butt. Um, and this, I can just you know, I can just add more hosts. Uh, recovery of LizardFest is very simple compared to Ceph. So Ceph has this tendency to do data shuffles. If you remove a host, it needs to basically shuffle all the data around. LizardFest doesn't have to do any of that stuff. It just sort of, it it sort of, it recovers the way you would think of it. The the missing blocks get re-replicated from good, good devices and balanced out um but it doesn't have to like shuffle everything around the way ceph does um if you know how ceph works that'll make sense if you don't that that probably should be another talk um uh the setup it's definitely more complicated than md admin but it's way less complex than ceph um you get the network out access out of the box which is similar to ceph but um compared to md admin you don't have to run like nfs or something on top uh, and it does, in fact, run fine on the Pi. Um, I wouldn't necessarily run the master on a Pi. I have done it, but it's it. You definitely benefit by having a something putting that on something with a bit more CPU. So let's talk about some um, disadvantages versus Ceph. And um, so one is very minimal security. Um, so it's got like the old style NFS export like IP based controls. Um, so, you know, only let this IP mount with these permissions kind of a thing at, for the clients. That's obviously not the most secure approach, which is why it's sort of no longer the, the, the way you're even supposed to do it with NFS. Um, and that's actually basically all the security it has. There's like nothing at the server side of it. So there's no authentication between master and chunk servers or anything like that. If something connects to a chunk server and says, hey, send me this block, it'll say, okay, here's the block. Um, and, or if a, some random host connects to the master and says, hey, I'm a new chunk server. Can you send me a ton of data? It'll send it a ton of data. So, you know, you really, if you wanted to use this in a serious environment you'd basically get the firewall the whole thing and and have some kind of proxy or something for the the like for the parts that are supposed to talk um the um the capacity scales greatly um so if you want to add tons and tons of drives not a problem at all but the actual io capacity doesn't scale nearly as well as ceph um because all the io basically has to go through the master I mean, the actual streaming of the data will come directly from the chunks, I believe, but because the only way a client can find out where to find a file, like what chunk ID and what server it's stored on, um, is by talking to the master, it means the master is going to get hit with every I.O. request. Ceph does not have a master. It has an algorithm that lets the client directly figure out where the chunk should be, um, and so it Ceph was built without those bottlenecks. Now that has a ton of issues when it comes to things like recovery, um, but and and some complexity and inflexibility. But um, but it scales incredibly well. This does not. Um, upstream development of LizardFS is sporadic. It's owned by a company that sort of has an on again, off again. Um, approach to it. I think it's kind of like somebody's spare project kind of a thing. Now, the the most recent stable release is very stable, um, doesn't really need a lot of updates or anything like that. But, you know, this is not getting a lot of attention where something like Ceph does get a lot of attention. And, and I would say this is really good for a home-sized install of up to 10 hosts. And, you know, I've often heard said with Ceph that the the performance on Ceph isn't very good below 10 hosts, um, whereas LizardFS is actually is great below 10 hosts. Um, so, um, and I'm talking by hosts like the the 
hosts with hard drives in them, you know, and, and I'm talking typical things like desktop PC hardware kind of stuff, not like servers that have 64 drives a piece. Um, although it would probably work fine. It's just, again, it's the IO per second that doesn't scale up. Um, likewise, this is good for bulk storage. I'm not sure I would use it for block storage for, uh, you know, running containers or something off of, which Ceph is great for. All right, so- Speaking of containers, I do have one question for you. Yeah. Which is, does uh, LizardFS, is that more of like, let's say a block storage then? Or is it more of like a S3, like object data storage, kind of like um, S3 is and what Ceph- Yeah, actually designed? neither. It's really, it's only interface is a POSIX file system. So you mount it with Fuse and you get, you know, a file system, you know, mounts into vfs or whatever like into into your kernel so you mount it like a mount point so everything is files and file operations you so cannot there is no you can't create like a block device and then install zfs on top of it right but it's more so as far as i would tell my web developers let's say if they were trying to play around with this at home i would say treat it like a block device not like an object data storage where you have to have because an object data storage it's where's the bucket what's the object key and yeah yeah it's yeah. not it's not key value like a like a traditional object store but but a block store typically um because because actually ceph store supports all three um a block store typically gives you a block device now of course you could stick a file on lizardfs and then use a loopback file system to create a block device out of it um you know or not a loopback file but a loop device you know to turn it into a block device so that would give you a block device but it's really not how it was designed to be used like you're storing files on it you're not storing file systems on it all right so um just a conceptual well, I think I kind of already talked through this. So I'll kind of gloss through this. So like the client might ask the, the master, like, give me a directory spool. And then the, you know, and then a client might ask the master, okay, let me open a file. And then the, the master tell the client, okay, well, here's all the chunks that make up the file and which server has each one. And the client will talk to each chunk server and just say, hey, um, give me the chunks. So just sort of a conceptual flow of how these things talk to each other. All right, so now we're actually gonna get into the demo. <clears throat> um, so um, getting started is actually pretty simple. So it's packaged on Debian Ubuntu, it is an R. I, I've got a Gen 2 package for it, but it's not in the main repository. Um, so typically the way you would do this is you would set up a master, and we're gonna do all this. Um, now the, the, the default config um, looks for the host name MFS master. So if you can give them, MF the master a C name in DNS for MFS master, it actually means that half your configuration files don't even need to be edited because that's pretty much where everything goes looking for the master. Um, now I won't be doing that because I already have this used and I don't want these new chunk servers talking to my production network. Um, uh, you set up, so you run, get your master running and then you set up as many chunk servers as you want, and you point each one to the master and they check in. Um, and then you would set up any shadow or meta loggers and point those to the master. You should at least have something like this for recovery. Um, this does recover very well. Like if you have a power failure or something, um, the only gotcha is um, in a recovery situation, you kind of have to go figure out which replica has the most recent version. It's not necessarily the master only because depending on if the master crashes and the disks didn't get flushed or something, it actually is possible that data got replicated before the disk caches got flushed. And so, you know, a replica might actually have a better view of the of the whole thing. Uh, that's a bit tangential. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and do this. So let me, uh, can you, I think I shared my screen correctly. Can you guys, can you guys see the terminal window? Yeah, we're good. It looks like it's uh, sharing this, the full yeah. screen and not just the window. Yeah, excellent. Um, and can you guys read that font size? Do you want me to make it a little bigger? Or... I'm good. Good for me. All right. I'll, no, I'll make it just a little bit bigger. There's actually not a lot. All right, so I've got a bunch of containers here. These are just, uh, these are 
not the way you're supposed to run containers. Um, I'm sure Will's cringing, but these are full Ubuntu LTS OS is running in each container. Um, and these are just basically just generic Ubuntu installs. There's nothing on here except for, like I set the host name and a little bit of that sort of thing, but there's no wizard FS anything installed on any of these. Um, to comment, as long as you're not using Docker, you're doing it right. <laughs> and I am not using Docker. All right, so let me, I'm gonna do some copy pasting here. So on the master, I'm gonna install two packages and that's LizardFS master, which is the master, and then the CGI server, which is the web server. And it should. I did update Ubuntu since the last time this was, I, I tried running this, but um, this should work. I can't imagine an Ubuntu LTS update would break something. If you want uh, rock solid updates, it's called Arch. <laughs> All right, and then I'm just gonna create a configuration file on this. Uh, if you're doing this for real, they have commented config file templates that you should use. Um, but I'm just, this is a, you can see how this is like, this is the configuration for the master. There's very little. <laughs> um, and basically, I'm telling the, the master server it is a master as opposed to a shadow master. It's the exact same daemon for shadows um, and giving it a user and group to run as. Um, then this is the exports. Um, so this is like, it's a little like NFS exports. This is basically um, what mount points it's going to export. And so... Um, I forget what this does. I think it basically says anybody can map, can can mount stuff, basically. Um, I forget, I think the one might be for metadata or something like that. I am going to this, whoops. This file contains the goals and I'm just creating two goals called one and two. And one is, um, one replica and two is two replicas. These are like, I think they're called tags. So you can group the chunk servers, which are the ones with the disks in them into groups. So if you could say something like I want two replicas and one is on this group of hosts and the other replicas on this other group of hosts, because maybe they're on different UPSs or in different data centers, or you, you can actually get a little more complex with this than what I'm doing. This just says, pick any two hosts and make a replica on it. Um, oh, this is this is a safety feature. The first time you create, uh, if you don't copy this template uh, in here, when you try to start the daemon, it will, it will panic because it doesn't look like you're, you know, it's basically looking like you're doing a fresh install and it doesn't want to obliterate any working data. Um, so if you don't do this step, it'll basically, die and and the log will say you know do that uh you don't have to worry about that that's actually a host so a container issue it's it's running and we'll see that in a second uh, now the uh the cgi server is actually even simpler um there's literally nothing to configure because you actually point it in the url to the master server so i'm going to go ahead and run this and I'm using um, zero config, uh, what MDNS or whatever addresses like Avahi. That's one of the things I did install on all the Ubuntu hosts so I don't have to mess around with IP addresses. And so I'm gonna go ahead and add chunks and servers and disks. There's not much to see here because basically it's running um, and there's literally nothing stored and there's no, no chunk servers checked in. So this is a very, inactive here i can show the mounts as well um, this actually has a ton of like i can show operations so it'll give stats um, maybe i'll show you this stuff once i actually put some data on here because it'll be a little more interesting it's got pretty charts too all right so uh we are now running blizzard fs um and the master just dynamically so right now it has 
no space available because there are no chunk servers. And as chunk servers check in with the master, you don't have to tell the master about chunk servers. The chunk servers just call up the master and say, hey, I'm here, because um, it's very not secure. Um, if you're doing this in Ceph, we'd be having to create certificate authorities and replicate you know, keys all over the place to, to make this work. Um, there's a nice Ansible playbook with like 875 plays in it that'll that'll do all this for you. Um, all right, so let's go to a chunk server. So we're gonna apt install Lizard FS chunk server. So this is you know, this is the the daemon for storage. And actually, I'm just gonna do these in parallel. So I have two chunk servers here. I am going to whoops. This is basically the only config file. And actually, I wouldn't even need to have this at all if I had named my master MFS master, because then that's the default for this. Um, but because I don't want these to connect to MFS master, because that's my production setup, it's just going to connect to um, this new master. And then this file here is what actually um it's basically just a list of hard drives so what this is is a list of directory paths um that will be used for storage oops i uh hang on a second i uh, hit control d too many times there um and so basically i told it to uh, what this file says is um, it, it's going to do storage in a directory called slash data. You can have multiple drives or mount points. Basically, just put hard drives on this thing and you mount them to mount points and put the mount points in this file. And that's where the storage will happen. And you can have as many mount points as you want. Um, and the, it, they just get essentially stacked together. Um, so I need to actually create that directory. And I need to set the ownership on it so that it can write to it. And then I run this. And now if I hit F5, boom, you can see there are now two chunk servers. And they've got, uh, well, there's no chunks on any of them. There's nothing stored. Um, they're just running off the host hard drive, so they got plenty of storage. Um, these, since these are containers, so these are actually two servers. They're actually storing it on the exact same hard drives, but you know, whatever. You're not going to run these on containers uh, like this, at least. Um, Challenge nothing, accepted. Well, there's nothing wrong with running in a container, but obviously you wouldn't actually put the storage for multiple redundant storage servers on the same host. True. All right, I'm going to skip this step. This is how you install the client, uh, but I can't actually do that in a container um, because these aren't privileged containers. And so um, it's not going to let me mount this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to is I'm going to Oh, one thing you'll find if you're using this, the command name. So Ubuntu renamed this to LFS mount, but the actual upstream name is MFS mount because um, they were too lazy when they forked MooseFS. Uh, that's why it's called MFS master. <laughs> um, it is the, uh, and so, um, so, um, you'll find some of the command names. Like another thing you'll see is things like some of the paths, some of the, some distros rename them to lizard FS, some distros it'll, they'll use the uh, directory name MFS for storage. So you kind of have to know, you have to poke around. Uh, I mean, it won't just change on you, uh, but you kind of have to poke around to find, figure out where things are. Uh, and so now I refresh this and you can see, I actually have a mount point mounted. Um, and so now I can do and now if I refresh, I have a chunk. 
Um, now the policy on that was set to one replica by default. Um, and so um, there's one chunk on one of the servers and zero chunks on the other, but I can, run this. Now, if I refresh it, so up here, I've got one chunk with two needed copies, but one actual copy, and it's in red because it's now considered endangered because there's only one replica left. And those, if it loses another replica, uh, it's lost. Um, you'll see there's now one copy to replicate. And if I refresh it, there's a loop. So this will actually, this could take a minute before it replicates, um, before the the loop won't take long to run because there's nothing on it. Um, one of the things ListrefS does is it has like a like a file system check loop, so it will do things like it'll read all the chunks, compare them to their hashes, and detect silent corruptions and that sort of a thing, um, and and it looks for health issues and that kind of thing. Um, now, if you start having you know, 100 terabytes of disk space, that can take a while because it only does it at a certain rate. And just, you know, there, I, I forget how parallel it does that. Um, I mean, it would tend to distribute that load, but it would, um, it, it could take a little while. Um, now you do get some stats. There's not gonna be a lot of stats here because it's not doing much, but you do get information on things like, um, you know, how many microseconds reads and writes and F-syncs are taking and that sort of thing. Um, you have pretty charts, so you can look at CPU usage or this is all the master server. You can see things like, you know, how many of various type of operations, um, you know, how many replicas per minute, you'll actually see that eventually move up when we when those when that replicates, um, the this is the storage. So I can look at number of low level read operations per minute or things like that. These are the chunk servers. Um, if I just pick one server, you can for a single chunk server, I'll just show you all the stats. So it's got all the pretty charts and everything. This is taking its time. Eventually, that'll replicate. Um, it, Goals are inherited from containing directories. So if I just set the goal on the, the root directory to two, then all new files will all be two. And you can change these after the fact, as, as you can see here, because we changed the policy and it'll eventually replicate. So we'll come back to that in a second. Actually, that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. So um, any questions while we just wait for that to replicate. Um, actually, no, I can actually show you what this looks like as well. So on, uh, if I look, you know, so the actual, once you, so this was an empty directory a minute ago. Um, once you start the server, you know, it, it basically creates a hash table uh, for all the chunks and somewhere in there, it's probably the one, yeah, so there's, one chunk and this probably has nothing on it yet. Yeah, because it hasn't replicated. So, um, you know, that's all that you see. And if we had multiple drives mounted on this thing, you would just have something like this in each one. Interesting. Oh, it replicated. So now we're at two replicas and this is now stable. Um, now, I could show you like failover or something like that, although to do that, I'd actually have to add a third host um, and then have one disappear so that things could, you know, re-replicate. But um, suffice to say, if you lose a host or something, you'll basically see everything on this table shifts one to the left, and then you'll start seeing, it'll prioritize the endangered chunks, um, but you'll start seeing the, the numbers march as the, the replication occurs. That's cool. So uh, any questions? 
No, I'm just kicking myself for like procrastinating playing with Lizard FS for like years. Yeah, so you've got some, uh, you know, I put, so this is in the slide deck. I mean, this is literally the, the commands I ran and it's just running on a, you know, just base. There was nothing done to these these hosts uh, other than installing a Vahi on them so I could use the dot .local uh, DNS name for the master. Um, that was pretty much the only thing I did to those hosts. Um, so it's real easy to set up. Of course, the actual, if you go to the actual docs directory or whatever your distro uses, you'll actually find, you know, you know, default config files that have a bazillion comments and things in them. There's a ton of tunable parameters and that sort of thing um, that's worth skimming through. Um, their website's actually half decent with the documents. It's not, uh, although you'll you'll get a you'll get a chuckle out of one thing on the website, and that is, oh, that's uh, interesting. Oh, this is like a new. They redid their website, and this does not look like what I've seen, like what I just yeah. pulled up. Are you at the right red site? You know, I wonder, are you at lizardfs. Oh, you know what it is? It's lizardfs.com now. Um, that's why. So the, the this po this points to lizardfs.org, and I think their their pretty stuff is now on windowsfs.com. Mm. And I think under somewhere there's the docs. I forget where the they have a documentation website. Oh yeah, there we go. Technical documentation and You'll you'll get a chuckle out of uh, securing your installation, and I think this this is the security documentation right here. So th this about sums it up as far as LizardFS security goes. Um, if you want a robust, secure distributed file system, just go with Ceph, <laughs> at least for now. I mean, you could secure this, but. You know, honestly, this is wonderful at home, especially for things like storing media or that sort of a thing. Um, it works great for that. The IO per second is not good, but just the streaming capability is actually very good because basically all your reads get distributed across all your servers. So if I have half a dozen servers, um, each one, uh, you know, they're they're running in parallel, much like say like Stripe Raid or something, or or Mirror Grade or something like that. Um, but you don't Not have the host file or running a VM from, but great yes. for reading media from. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect for media backups, storage, things like that. You could use it for. Um, you know, I wouldn't run. I mean, you could probably run a vm off of it or something like that but it's really not designed for io per second where something like ceph is wonderful for io per second um but it's also a lot more cumbersome well the big thing is the ram that's the main thing keeping me away from ceph is having to have like gigabytes of ram per hard drive um you know that's if you have a lot of hard drives that's a lot of ram and ram is expensive Any other questions? I was going to ask if there's a, a way to use uh, Kubernetes with it, but I just saw it's been another to-do list for a while and it's not going to happen, so. Yeah, if you look at their issues list, well, again, this is where they're not putting a ton of time into it. If they got more enterprise customers or something, they might put more time, but honestly, you know, I am not sure. I don't know why somebody would choose this in the enterprise so much. Uh, it's, you can do it, but um, let me, I'll play with something. Let me show you something. Oh, stop. So I just killed one of our chunk servers. And now you can see our one chunk of data is now endangered. And you can see the chunk server is now disconnected. Now, if we had other chunk servers available, you would eventually see this replicate 
and anything else that was on the server would eventually replicate to the other servers available. Um, there are no other servers available, so uh, it, you know, it, it, nothing will happen here. But and then eventually, if I if I uh, start this back up, it will check back in, and it, it takes a. If there's a lot of data, it takes a couple of seconds. You'll actually see a progress bar as it's getting scanned, um, and you'll see. You know, these counts rapidly, everything starts shifting to the right as data gets right in. And in fact, um, what you'll find is if like a chunk server goes down, while it's down, all the data on the cluster will all start getting re-replicated. Um, but then once the, if a chunk server comes back up, you know, then suddenly everything will get moved one column to the right and that you'll see a whole bunch of data is over goal. And then a few minutes later, it'll start deleting data basically de-replicating um you know i mean that happens if a chunk server is down say for a couple of hours or something um you know if you have multiple you know multiple hard drives in each of these servers the time to replicate can be considerable um uh ceph will probably replicate faster um but i'm also just running this on gigabit um you know if you're doing this like if you're doing like serious block storage, you're probably going to be running NVMEs, multiple NVMEs per host on a 10 gigabit network. And that will, of course, perform completely differently from this. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, how is this similar or different than GlostrFS? Oh, gosh. So I am not as familiar with Gluster. Um, <clears throat> will, do you I... have a comment? I will totally comment, and I think there's someone else in the chat, if they wish to uh, relive some of those horrors, may comment also if they want. Anyway, um, so the big thing with Gluster is just like the comparison to Ceph, is that you're going to need a lot more RAM. The way that Gluster goes is you set up a brick very similar to a chunk file, but with Gluster it uses some weird type of algorithm that's not as nice as what they use for like etcd for like configuration management uh not configuration uh like a uh, a fast key store um gluster will basically try to make sure that it'll have consensus but with gluster with each node because there's no master nodes you may run into an issue what they call a split brain where you'll have the gluster accidentally segment itself and then you have to get all those different replications to play nice with each other and fix the split brain issue. Pretty much Gluster is fine until you have a split brain and then trying to fix that. You go from, uh, oh, this is easy to needing a PhD in storage uh, issues courtesy of Red Hat. So, I mean, it's great if you have a very expensive Red Hat contract but if you are on your own, don't even chance it. I can't tell you how many people that have just blown out a brick and reinstalled it just going, yeah, I couldn't figure out what's going on. It's pain. So fundamentally, Gluster and LizardFS are like solving the same problem, which is uh, making a distributed uh, POSIX, you know, file system. Yes. Like NFS, but NFS that grows out, you know, horizontally. Um, but yeah, the Gluster suffers from design issues that it champions as like its big win. It has no dedicated metadata server, which it'll point out in like all of its documentation as being, wow, great, look at this, no single point of failure. Sure, but the way that that's implemented is that the clients themselves like handle everything. And if you have a client misbehave terribly, it can trash the whole file system for everybody else. And it will yeah, replicate okay. the trash. Yeah. I think Seth doesn't suffer as much from that, but no, does, Seth is authoritative like on the servers themselves. It's much better designed. Yeah, but it but it also it uses the Rados algorithm. That, I mean Seth is worth Seth Rush. is worth multiple talks. Uh but it's um but yeah, it's a crush, yes. Um the maps and it basically um it's just an algorithm that basically when you take an object and you calculate it's you know you it's like a hashed object idea or whatever from that id 
and knowing the configuration, like the topology of the, the cluster, the client can figure out exactly which servers will contain that object. And so the client can directly talk to the, the endpoint, you know, the actual storage servers without any master server to intervene. And, and what you have are these monitor servers, which do just track the topology so that the clients can find out what it is. And they also sort of keep track of which servers are online and vote on sort of the consensus for the network. And if, if a node is down, they figure that out. And, and, but the issue is that when a node goes down, because it's all basically driven by this algorithm, which is kind of like a hash, um, if, if you lose a server, that changes the configuration and thus the destination for every block on the file system changes. And so basically the file system has to basically move every single block on the file system from one server to another. Um, so it's this massive, now it's because it's extremely parallel because there's no central server guiding all this, it can happen pretty quickly, but that's part of what I think what contributes to the um, RAM requirements. So the RAM requirements, as I understand, aren't too bad until something fails. And then the RAM requirements are very high and the problem is if you run out of RAM, the whole thing just freezes until you go and find some way to add RAM. <laughs> um, so I've heard horror stories of Seth. Basically what I've heard is keep it, give it plenty of RAM so it doesn't, this never happens to you because you don't want this to happen to you. And Gluster is pretty much on the same thing. Now, the fun part that I do have to mention about Gluster that gets forgotten is um, you don't want to run a Gluster server with equal number of nodes. You want it to be odd. Otherwise, um, you'll have an issue with the authoritative part um, with being shared. It'll uh, you you may have some servers that may just try to like split brain itself on this on the spot. So Red Hat will always bring up Ceph and Gluster, and they will always try to push a Gluster uh, service on you because I'm just convinced it's just a matter of time before Gluster blows up and then they'll try to sell you something better to fix the problem after it. It's like selling yeah. a Yugo, it blows up and it's like, oh, but we actually have here a car that doesn't blow up and you're in production, so you need this, so take this. Yeah, I I don't get why they're... So, so for a while, I could see why they stuck with Gluster for a while because it's more established. Um, and Ceph is the newcomer. Uh, but I feel like it's kind of, you know, it's not so new anymore. It's like EXT4. When it first came out, you know, everybody avoided it for a year or two. But like today, you know, if somebody wasn't using it, you'd kind of look at them funny. It's, you know, it's 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 okay to not be the early adopter. But Ceph has got, you know, certainly it's I... Just I yeah, inertia, like most of... Uh... Most of like the site infrastructure services, like their you know site licensing for Red Hat includes Gluster by default, so it's just kind of baked into a lot of their crap as an option. Hmm. And Ceph is an additional like rather expensive. The last time I asked, uh, upgrade uh, if you want that included on your license, we run upstream. Uh, but okay. yeah, I think uh, I think it's just inertia, and with them. Uh, end of life and you know they're like traditional red hat or traditional like virtualization tools like rev and whatnot and going more for open shift is you know like the kubernetes distribution of choice they're going to start pushing uh ceph more okay yeah well and, i mean so ceph itself is open source but but of course yeah. if you want red hat support and everything if you want red hat support you gotta pay for it yeah, um, well, and the typical config for one of these things are you're you're typically using these in very large installs. So, you know, you're 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 spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on hardware potentially for these things, certainly tens of thousands. Um certainly. so you know it kind of makes sense to do it right in those cases. Whereas Lizard FS is more like rubber bands and you know string and yeah so i just posted a link if you want to pull it up quick um 
Rich. Uh, if I can figure out how to. Oh, hit okay. uh, Control F. Yeah, I got Alt it. F. Yeah. So Rook is Ceph for Kubernetes. And they've made it a CNCF project, so it's fairly easy to install. Um, this is, if you want to know the main reason why Ceph is taking off, is because there's a free way to easily install it as a Kubernetes native storage. And yes, Kubernetes clusters are now considered to be the ideal host for databases and storage. I don't know if you feel that way, but the industry just decided now's the time. Well, and you mentioned things like odd numbers of servers. So if you're running Ceph, the actual monitor daemon, which is sort of like the high availability component that mm -hmm. fails hosts, those you tip, I believe it, at least the last time I looked, you're supposed to run an odd number of those for just that reason, but that's just one component, which is very lightweight. Um, and then, um, Likewise, I don't have it because you need a license for it. Although there's a new there's a new version of LizardFS that's not yet stable where that is now open source. They open source the high availability component, but that daemon that does the high availability bit, again, you want an odd number of replicas. It's also very lightweight because all it does is just sort of monitor things and vote consensus on if the master server needs to be changed. And then it would it just connects to the, the new master and says, hey, you're the new master. I don't know exactly how it works because I'm using a DNSC name to redirect all that. So I don't know how that part of it works, but uh, so the chunk servers know which one to go to. But I, I assume there's documentation on it if you have it. Well, thank you for definitely showing, demonstrating bringing one offline and one online. Um, I will have to say, if I were to compare this raw with just Gluster by itself, one thing that uh, no one ever likes to remember or bring up is if you are doing a home lab and you decide to use Gluster, you need a minimum of four nodes. Now, you could do this whole thing on one. You could run this whole thing on one host if you wanted to, one chunk oh, yeah. server, one master. Uh, I mean, obviously wouldn't have any replication. No, no, no. I was saying but... for a Gluster, though, if for a home oh, lab, yeah. the reason why I'm arguing against it is um, you, they want you to have four nodes, but of course they don't want you to have even nodes. So they really want five. But the reason why is if you have, so with Gluster, if you go below three nodes, the nodes that you have, you cannot guarantee the highly available rights will actually sync. So it goes into a read-only mode at below three nodes. Yeah, and, and certainly LizardFS is much simpler in that regard. So this, this, so that's the beauty of LizardFS is it scales all the way down, which is what I wanted for around the house. Basically. Oh, and cheaper nodes. You don't have to worry about all that load on your, your dumb nodes. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the disk storage, all it literally does, I mean, they don't use any RAM at all. They uh, just store um i don't know if i can i assume uh so i have a question have you tried mixing and matching um your arm nodes with x86 or must everything be the same binary uh no no it doesn't matter as long as i'm in a so on a well of course a host has to be the native architecture but no no it doesn't care um because in fact the um my master is running on x86 and my most of my nodes are on ARM, my storage, but I actually have a x86 storage as well for my production. It doesn't, because it's all, there's nothing, uh, the, the network level layer is all, you know, it it's, doesn't have any Indianness uh, issues or anything like that. It's, it's, it's clean. So yeah, this, not, not, you know, the client doesn't care what the server is running on. It just talks the protocol. I'm practically sold right there alone. Awesome. Yeah, check. You know, I I would have thought that that I would have thought system control stats would tell me what the RAM use is, but it's going to be small. Oh, um, you can always pop out some free mem cat on free not mem. Actually, I can just run. Uh, why is this not? Oh, size. There you go. 
Yeah, it's not using much. Well, that's not bad at all. That's where I'm in a container. I can run PS and get and get a short list. Cool. Does anyone have any other questions? I don't. I'm just I'm just sitting here thinking that like 97 percent of this is well over my head, but I still find it fascinating. Yeah, well, you know, I do recommend playing with it if you're interested in it, just because, and you can read the docs, but, um, you know, like these these couple of slides, this is literally all you need to do in order to get a, uh, you know, a uh, um, a cluster running. Yeah, and then it's, then, it's just to... a, then it's just a mount point. So, I mean, I, on here, I can copy whatever I want onto here. Uh, Jared, if you want... Um when the bridge gets fixed up just ping rich because he's rich zero or as we say in plug he is rich prime um <laughs> well there were two riches and he had a zero so he became rich prime that's awesome yeah so anyway so rich prime will be on uh irc when the bridge note gets there yep <laughs> uh so but the bridge is down right now so if you are not on irc well then um, tough nuggies, you shouldn't be using Slack. Come back to uh, the, uh, the 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 free node ways because it's the best way. Yeah, I'll I'll see if I can get the links to the. You're you're the not slide. even on free node. Come on now. Well, it was there back in the before times. Now it's Libera, but yes. Yeah, well, so there I is still I... free node. Too. We my... still do have a channel on free node with people in it, or at least there were two other people earlier today. But I, I don't know. I, I like my threads and my, my mobile history and such that I get with, with Slack. So that's those are my primary things. But oh, I, I, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I totally understand the, the geek factor of the IRC, and I'm certainly not opposed to hopping in there. Well, um, that's what Matrix is for. But oh, I yeah. just need I just need to finish like or start. I need to start and finish setting up my lab environment. I have a whole separate server rack that I intend to use for lab type stuff, but it's just sitting not plugged into anything whatsoever. So we should probably fix that at some point. Oh, Jared, I think we can shut off the uh, recording now. <laughs>